Hello, it's Jen Taub. Welcome back to Booked Up, a podcast that features you, me, and our favorite authors. This week, my guest is Professor Steve Laddick, author of the sensational new book, The Shadow Docket, how the Supreme Court uses stealth rulings to amass power and undermine the Republic. The Shadow Docket is a must-read book, not just for court watchers and garden variety nerds, but also for anyone and everyone who wants to sound smarter on Twitter. Okay, maybe that's a low bar, but you get the drift. And don't just trust me. Publishers Weekly said the Shadow Docket is an expert study and that this insightful and accessible account raises an important alarm. Plus, Patrick Radin Keefe, author of the book on Purdue Pharma called Empire of Pain, praised Steve for using elegant, accessible prose to expose the degree to which significant battles from abortion to immigration are being adjudicated behind closed doors in unseen, unsigned, unexplained decisions. And as friend of the podcast, Dahlia Lithwick warned, we ignore what happens in the shadows at our peril. So who is Steve Leddick? He is a professor at the University of Texas at Austin School of Law, where he holds the Charles Allen Wright Chair in federal courts. He is a nationally recognized expert on the federal courts, constitutional law, national security law, and military justice. But anyone can claim to be an expert on paper, but Steve is the real deal, not just in the classroom and prestigious academic journals like the Harvard Law Review and Yale Law Journal, but also in courtrooms. He has argued over a dozen cases before the United States Supreme Court, the Texas Supreme Court, and various lower federal, civilian, and military courts. But most importantly, he seems like a really nice person. I'm looking forward to learning from him. Let's dive in. Hello. Hey, Jen. I can hear you great. Are you? Where are you, Steve? Uh, I'm in my office. Home or school? Uh, my school office. Karen would not let me have nearly as many tchotchkes and stuff at home. Well, that's what I'm trying to see. What's behind you? Are there? Because that looks like toys, not books. It's hard for me. What's? Can you? Can you? Are those little teacups or what? what I so can't. I've got. I have an assortment of uh, bobbleheads, which are slightly <gasps> off camera. Um, oh. Like random coffee mugs that are collectibles of different shapes and sizes and other random tchotchkes and Funko Pop dolls and other things accumulated over 18 years of this this bizarre career we have. I love that. I have a lot of, you can't see them because of the shot I'm in now, but I, I love stuff like that. And um, when you were, when we first all started teaching online during COVID, did you ever use the tchotchkes to illustrate something? Every once in a while I would use, um, I have a decent Supreme Court bobblehead collection. And so, especially when talking about more historical figures, I would sometimes bust out the bobbleheads to give them at least some three-dimensional uh, existence. It's funny. I think I was teaching, um, I must have been teaching like derivative litigation for a like business orgs class. Mm -hmm. And I think I was using um, calico critters yep, for yep, that. Yep. I mean, you know, which are awesome until the kids found out. Well, I was going to say. Not the students. My kids got you know, I mean, if I, if I dared to take any of my daughter's calico critters from the playroom in our house, I would, I would, be, I would be dead the next day. It's really funny. I, I didn't expect us to be talking about calico critters, but one year my now teenager, uh, when they were like, when Axel was maybe, I don't know, you know, young enough, like maybe first or second grade, it was time to get Michael, um, you know, his Father's Day present. And so the Father's Day present was the hedgehog family of calico critters. So, you know, I don't know if your kids are as creative as that with presents for you, but. Um, not so, really, so they but, can you keep know. Them. They're four and seven. I think any present, any present for me that is something they can use, I think is something to be down with. Um, so I want to ask one other thing. I, I don't usually talk about people's kids that much, but you have one of your kids. I don't know if it's uh, one of them. I don't want to maybe say their names on a podcast, but one is like this crazy talented artist. Yeah. So my seven-year-old, um, uh -huh. actually, I mean, uh, her name's on my faculty webpage, okay. um, Ma Madeline or Maddie. Okay. Um, so. Um, Maddie is, you know, a fantastically gifted artist, which is funny because neither Karen nor I can, you know, do anything. So I have no idea where <laughs> she got it from. Um, but she's also been lucky to have a fantastically gifted art teacher at her school. Oh, uh, and, let's go together, and, yeah. And her art teacher is retiring this year. So we, we will find out next year how much of this is Maddie and how much of this is her teacher. Oh, boy. 
I'm sure it's Maddie. And then the other kid, is Sydney the one, or is it also Maddie, that that basically is running the entire family and can, can find logical gaps in any um, kind of rule that she has to follow? Um, Maddie, so Sydney's, Sydney's the four and a half year old. Sydney is... Um, Maddie is the methodical sort of processor um, who's going to pick apart any argument you make. Okay. Sydney is more of the sort of, you know, smile and make googly eyes at you until she gets her way. Okay, so who was the kid when, like, Karen threatened something about the bath or said you have to – she was really upset about something and said, fine, I'm not going to be your mom anymore, whatever it was. And yes. one of the kids was like, fine, I'll just – that sounds cool to me. That was that was Maddie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'm actually guessing that she is a talented artist just based on that. <laughs> okay, so let's let's. Uh, so in addition, it turns out Steve to like um, being able to be a father. This is not not meant to be like I'm like we're, we're, what we're, kind of a feminist reverse thing. Like we talk about the kids. <laughs> Like, oh, like like in the obit where we're going to talk about what a good father you were first and then mention on the side that, like, you have made, you know, had several arguments before the U.S. Supreme Court and have launched one of the most important new uh, theories of jurisprudence. But no, I start with your kids because, I don't know, that's a way we uh, are. That's what I start with, so it works out well. I mean, right? I mean, okay. So um, I also, speaking of um, the personal stuff, I always start books by reading the acknowledgments. And it tells me a lot about folks, because I know when you write a book, often it's the last thing you do. But I think it takes, it's really important to take a lot of care with that, um, who you leave in, who you leave out, how you talk about people. And I noticed um, there was one person that you expressed gratitude for. It really touched me. And this was um, a college professor of yours, Nasser Hussein, who passed away sadly in 2015. And I wonder if it's okay if you share a little more about him and the impact he had on you. Sure. Um, I mean, he had he had enormous impact. I mean, so um, Nasser Hussein was a brilliant um, law and emergency scholar, um, you know, sort of a, a PhD, but with like a heavy legal side. Um, and he was in his second year um, as a junior professor at Amherst um, when I was a freshman. And, you know, I sort of fell into a, a class he taught in the spring of 1998, the spring of my freshman year, by accident, because all the other classes I wanted to take were full. Um, and the class was called Law and Historical Trauma. And it was this stunningly um, multifaceted look um, at how law and legal culture um, both facilitates and then responds to crisis and emergency. Um, and what, what what's perhaps most telling about the classes, even though it was called Law and Historical Trauma, it wasn't part of the Law, Jurisprudence, and Social Thought I department was going to ask you that. At Amherst. Yeah. No, it was, it was a history class, um, huh. which is why I took it, because I was an aspiring history major. I thought, I thought I wanted to be a historian. And, you know, we studied things like, you know, it's not just like war crimes tribunals and truth commissions, but like what narrative purposes those bodies serve the sort of the creation of historical memory um, and the, the the sort of the law politics and culture of memory. Um, this sounds like a book Martha Minow would write or something. Yes. Well, so we read. So I mean, Martha Minow was one of the people we read. <laughs> I mean, I, I I first read Martha Minow as a as a freshman in college, um, and, and what I found so profoundly transformative about Nasser's approach to this material was that it was so not heavy-handed. Like, it was, there was no moralistic narrative that, like, you know, the arc of the universe is long, but it bends toward justice. Rather, it was that law is both a tool of violence and a tool of redressing violence. And that's sort of a paradox of law. Mm -hmm. um, no, I mean, yeah. that's... I mean, I love that, though, too. I mean, I think I try... Whenever you're doing sort of a, what we would call, like, in law school, perspectives, perspective-type mm -hmm. type class... Yeah, I try to leave students with, you know, the complexity. Um, but I, it's interesting that you mention that his class wasn't um, part of Austin Serrett's kind of little fiefdom there. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, that, that's, that's not to say that like Nasser and Austin weren't close. They were very close. Um, and mm -hmm. Nasser's appointment, um, I think by the end, it was a joint appointment between the history okay. and LJST departments. Um, but actually, ironically, I managed to get through all of Amherst College without ever taking a class that was LJST as such, um, which for a person who does what I do so is kind LGST, of... So LJST, you say the uh, Law, Jurisprudence, and Social Thought. Yes, um, which can, is not, yeah. it's not like purely pre-law, but it's, it's very pre-law. Um, mm -hmm. So, but so, what, so Nasser, I mean, what Nasser really did for me is, you know, first he opened my eyes to sort of law as a 
historical enterprise and not just as a sort of contemporary enterprise. Um, I come from mm -hmm. a family of lawyers, so you know, sort of law as a litigation tool was not foreign yeah. to me. Um, but the law and the politics of memory just like blew me away. Um, but second, he had such a sort of a skeptic's affect. Um, you know, I would go to his office and you know, sort of beat my head into the his desk trying to sort of figure out what he thought about something because he was just such a, you know, um, he was a skeptic. He was Socratic. He really, you know, he didn't want you to have his ideas. He wanted you to have your ideas. And it was such a model of teaching and of sort of inspiring me to think um, and to write. So, so I just like, from, I was hooked. So from that point, I, I took like four more classes with him in college. Um, I did like an independent research project with him. Mm -hmm. He supervised my, my honors thesis in history. I mean, it was, you know, it was, I, I, if, if I could do, if, if I could spend time with Nasser, I would. Um, and so one of the coolest things of my career was like, um, he invited me back to Amherst as part of a conference they, that he and Austin Sarrett put together sort of oh. midway through the Bush administration uh -huh. on um, whether, on whether sort of lawyer, uh, basically who's responsible for the alleged war crimes of the Bush administration. Um, and, you know, should we prosecute the lawyers? <laughs> um, and, and, I, and, and it was like, of everything I've written in my life, Jen, the, the paper I wrote for Nasser's conference, now as a colleague and not as his student, was the yeah. most terrifying thing I ever did. Do you know, it's so funny you should say that because I had this moment, um, <laughs> I had to testify, or I had the opportunity of testifying once before the Senate Banking Committee, and it was, uh, I think, summer of 2016, it was related to liquidity and leverage and, you know, in, in banking. And I remember that I was more nervous preparing for the Q&A for that because Elizabeth Warren was on the committee than I ever was for her class when I took bankruptcy at law school. Like, I don't even, I, I don't recall ever preparing <laughs> that much, yeah, no, I mean, you know? there, I mean, there's, there's something about, <laughs> when, when you have a mentor, like, there's something about the first time that you're on equal footing where you're so terrified of disappointing them. Um, well, and she I'm wasn't. Sort of, yeah. I mean, you might probably were a better law student than I was. I think, um, I wouldn't call Warren a mentor. I looked up to her. But I think when I was in law school, I was still, re you know, kind of rejecting the whole intellectual project mm -hmm. uh, that, you know, that law was anything. You know, I was hoping law would be a tool for social change. But I really thought it was just, you know, the master's tools can't dismantle the master's house. And I was very much like, I was like few, a few months into when I got to Harvard, I was part of the group that, um, you know, sued the law school. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so I was, that was what I was, and I was like wanting to be a writer, and I thought I was above the whole thing, which was really stupid, because in retrospect, I actually really love law now, and now I can never graduate from law school. Now I'm back here, you know, teaching, and it's the best ever. Um, but I, oh, no, I, I, I tell I, people that I'm a, I'm a 21L. That's so funny. I, I'm way older than that. Um, but yes, I'm probably like a 30 one L. I, I can't remember when you graduated. But yeah, I, I went back, though. I don't know if you've done this, but I, I visited, um, actually visited and taught in the fall of 2019 at Harvard. And it healed all those painful memories. Like it was incredible to be having brex breakfast with Martha. She had been my civ pro professor or Randy Kennedy taught me contracts and like making peace mm -hmm. with like all the stuff, you know, yeah, whatever. I, I could go on and on. But this isn't supposed to be about like that. But yes. Yeah, so I'm no, so but, glad. But yeah, I, I, but there's but if I if I might I mean at the risk of of, of creating a segue but I, I actually think <laughs> that there's there, there's one way that that Nasser's legacy sort of looms over the book not just in the acknowledgments um, uh -huh. so he and I at a bunch of different points in our work together came back to the idea of shadows um, and of sort of uh -huh. law law in shadows um, so I wrote a paper my junior year of college called Nagasaki's Shadow. Um, mm. which was the, the sort of the, the idea was, the paper actually argued that, um, you know, there's this great debate about whether the, the nuclear bombings of, Hir of Hiroshima and Nagasaki were war crimes. Um, yeah. and, I, and I argued, actually, in the paper that Hiroshima clearly wasn't, but Nagasaki probably was. Um, right. And the, so, I mean, you know, the, the junior in college, what do I know? But then my senior thesis was called Leipzig Shadow. Cause it was about the sort of the war, the war crimes trials after World War One that no uh -huh. one knows about and how if you actually accounted for the things in the shadows that no one knows about, you tell a different picture and a different story of international criminal justice in the 20th century. Nuremberg would look much more aberrational. You know, this is so interesting because I didn't know about war crime trials after World War One. I. I just had a really um, 
great conversation. It hasn't aired yet with um, David De jo- David De Jong, mm-hmm. who wrote Nazi Billionaires, right? Yep. But yep. I, I didn't know about. I know we're supposed to be talking about um, about uh, about the shadow docket, but can you? Quickly tell me a little bit about the World War One trials. Yeah, I mean, uh, this is why I think it's a segue because there's, you know, the, the sort of <laughs> the, the idea is that like narratives that don't include what's in the shadows tend to not be holistic and to not not to right. be complete. So um, there was a concerted effort after World War One to prosecute Kaiser Wilhelm, um, to prosecute the Pashas, to prosecute sort of senior officials who are responsible for the war itself and for some of the you know more heinous acts committed during the war in international war crimes trials. Um, there are provisions in the Treaty of Versailles that actually purport to cr- uh, uh, sort of nod toward those trials. Um, mm-hmm. There were efforts by the Allies. I mean, the part of the story is that the U.S. actually is almost directly responsible for killing this project, um, Wilson and his Secretary of State Lansing. Um, but there were there were really concerted efforts to try Wilhelm um, and to try the Turks. Um, first, the the sort of and, and so what, some of those trials were going to be uh, run by the Brits in Constantinople, and some were going to be run by the Allies in Leipzig. Um, but they all fall apart, um, and so there end up being just a couple of really really rinky dink German national trials in Leipzig, and a couple of really rinky dink British trials in Constantinople. And the only precedent they set is that no one remembers them. Um, so that, mm-hmm. you know, the sort of the notion that there is this tradition of international criminal accountability is actually belied by the failed effort to vindicate that principle after World War One. So that's really interesting. I'm surprised I didn't know that. And I and I promise to get back to your book. But when as you're talking about Versailles, I'm just wondering if you ever had a chance to read one of my favorite um, uh, biographies, which is uh, The Price of Peace about John Maynard Keynes. Yep, yep. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So you know. Anyway, but I. But there was like, a time in my life where I was obs- yes, yes. There was a time <laughs> in my life where this was where when I thought I was going to be a historian. Like I actually thought interwar European history was going to be my my sort of my my thing. Um, life and here is I am. over. You're young. <laughs> you're young, Steve. I mean, you'd be. I didn't think I'd be a podcaster because there wasn't even thing called a podcast. So here you go. Okay. So let's let's talk let's talk about the shadow docket. Um, so uh, I, I guess you know the, the shortcut. I'm sure most people will ask you about this is like. What is the shadow docket, and why did you write this book? Um, so, uh, I, I want to ask you um, to be stupider than you are, um, and 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 not yet. Let's let's walk through this before we get into kind of the nuanced weeds. Yeah. And tell me if there's like if there's a shadow docket, there's a docket in the sunshine, or the yes. merits docket, or whatever. So yes. can you can you kind of and, and, and the thing is, you know, because I you know. Being how we all how we are, either you know predisposed to be argumentative, um, or trained as lawyers, there's always this. I try to be like objectionable. Like I try to not hold back my objections, but most of the time, and I imagine you know if somebody you know if I were Samuel Alito reading this, I would be like, ha. well, well, so what? Like big deal. You're making it sound like this is illegal. We can do whatever we want, and we've been able to do whatever we want since for a very long time. So what's mm-hmm. the w- not not just what's the harm, but are you exaggerating? Have the shadows grown bigger? Have they been used for a different thing? So as you sort of tell the story, I just want to keep in mind that like the skeptic, skeptical brain, which I don't actually subscribe to because I actually know the answers to those questions. But I want to imagine that there are people who don't know much about law beyond, you know, law and order television shows or what they heard about the Dobbs decision, how Roe v. Wade was overturned. But beyond that, don't know much about fed- the federal court system. Um, and by the way, you don't have a whole semester to teach them. So can you run with that? Yes. Um, so <laughs> I mean, I mean, so let me start at the beginning. Um, there is a tendency on the part of especially conservatives on social media who assume they know what my motives are and everything I've said um, to portray me as being anti-shadow docket. Um, OK, the, so the, the first thing to say is um, I am not anti-shadow docket, right? My, the, the, the most significant purpose of this book is not to persuade people that my views of the shadow docket are correct, but to help them understand what it is in the first place. Um, I love that. Okay. And 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 the sort of you know the it's the it's the latter stages of the book where I actually where I, where my where I think my voice comes out a little more prominently. Um, and so Can the, I just the, jump in and say that yeah. becomes really clear because like one of the first examples you use um, is William O. Douglas trying to stop the bombing in Cambodia yes. through the early shadow docket. So you right. you kind of like 
make that point early on, but go ahead. No, no, I mean, I mean, Jed, there are, there are, let me, let me say this. None of the anecdotes in the book, and there are a lot of anecdotes in the book, none of those are there by accident. I mean, right, like the, the anecdotes are strategic. Um, of course. And, and, and part of the story I'm trying to tell is, is, is this multifaceted story where multiple things can be true. So, you know, the thing number one that is true, um, for almost as long as the Supreme Court has existed, it has, it has had a procedural docket, right? It has had a sort of set of rulings that don't take the form of the conventional fancy 65 or 70 page merits decisions that we're used to getting in argued cases that, you know, we tend to think about when we think about Supreme Court decisions. All the way back to the beginning of the court, right? There were, there were unsigned, unexplained orders managing the court's docket. So the sort of the- Oh, wait, let me back up. I know this is a really basic. You and I have been throwing around the word docket. Uh, yeah, Just give a sure. quick definition of what a docket sure. is. Sure, I mean, so uh, the docket is literally <laughs> just like the, um, the, 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 in the old days, the physical, and now the sort of technological sort of compendium of all of the cases that a court has before it. Um, okay, the, in, it. the inbox, if you will, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, every court, has an inbox where it has, here are all the cases that are pending before me. And within those cases, there are often a whole lot of sort of subsidiary questions or procedural issues that have to be resolved before you get to who wins and who loses. Um, mm -hmm. And so the, the, so when we talk about the Supreme Court's docket, we literally mean, right, the, the cases that are before the court in some way, shape, or form. The requests from litigants for some kind of action from individual justices or from the full court. And historically, our focus, and by our, I mean law professors, people who write about the court publicly, the media, the focus on what the Supreme Court does has been dominated by what, what many people, you, you, you were one of, like, call the merits docket. The merits docket being cases where the Supreme Court hears a full appeal, right, uh, holds oral argument, hands down these lengthy, you know, very, very usually well-written opinions, um, maybe there are multiple opinions in the same case. Maybe there are concurrences and dissents, right? Like that's what most people think about when they think about the output of the Supreme Court. Um, it has never been true that that chunk is a majority of what the Supreme Court does, um, mm -hmm. right? And so, so the sort of the superficial claim that like that we've always had a shadow docket. I mean, that's true. We have all there's always been a shadow docket, um, and indeed, I mean, I think there's a sense in which the word shadow is not inherently pejorative, right? Shadows are the natural reflection of light being cast onto a source. Um, and sort of what's behind, you know, what is behind the thing that light is being cast on is not necessarily bad. Um, so, right, the, the, the point is not that like bad things necessarily happen in the shadows. The point is, in the first instance, if we want to understand the Supreme Court as an institution holistically, we ought to be paying attention to more than just 1% of its work. Um, and let me just jump in to use your, you, you know, you said all the anecdotes in here are deliberate. I think what I hear you saying about the shadow docket is the Supreme Court should be deliberate. When are you going to do something in a full flown, you know, sort of hear all the arguments, deliberate, um, write something up, consider it, and make it public, your reasoning, what should that be used for versus when is it okay to do the cursory yes-no kind of thing with very little um, deliberation and so on? Like, it's appropriate. It's like in, in our lives, too, right? If you think about our inbox, I mean, if you're making a decision about, like, I don't know. We make a lot, a zillion decisions every day. Like, do I pick up the black pencil or the whatever pencil? We do not need to have a whole discussion in my family about what pencil to use. But if it's something more important, like where's the family vacation going to be, I should not use the shadow docket, meaning I just decide on my own, to do that. And I think that's really important, no? Yeah, and, and I would say not just I decide on my own, but I decide without any explanation, um, right? So, oh, okay. you know, right, if, if, um, so, right if, a, if a student emails me and says, do you have office hours today? I can write back, yes, and usually that's the end of it, right? If a student says, <laughs> can you please explain, you know, the sort of um, circumstances in which uh, uh, this prisoner could bring a federal habeas petition, right? If I write back and say, you know, um, yes, that's not really going to answer the student's question, right? So, right. I mean, the, the, so the, the moral, I mean, the moral here is that, like, at the top level, I think there is a huge gap in public understanding and awareness of the Supreme Court that is being routinely perpetuated and exacerbated by the media because we are focusing on the merits docket to the exclusion of 
everything that's happening in the shadows. And what's happening in the shadows includes which cases the justices are choosing to hear and not to hear, right, by granting or denying certiorari. Um, it includes when the justices are or are not granting emergency relief, meaning, you know, sort of freezing a lower court ruling or freezing a government policy while a case works its tedious way through the legal system to the Supreme Court, um, right? Like that stuff happens a lot. Um, and by volume, it happens far more than actually sure. what happens on the merits docket, especially lately. And so before we get to any of the sort of critiques of the current court, of which there are many in the book, right? The, the, the first, the, the, the point on which I try to build common cause is like, we should all be thinking about the, the contemporary court in the broader historical context where the way it operates is defined by um, all of the power it has in the shadows and indeed, Jen, power that it has largely amassed in the shadows compared to 150, 200 years ago, right? That yes, there's always been a shadow docket, but actually there have been some really profound ways in which the court has both asked for and arrogated a lot of power in what it does in these orders, in these procedural orders that really directly affect um, not just the merits cases that we tend to be fixated on, but everything else about the court's work. So so like if, if I and accomplish- let me just jump yeah. in for a second. Like I feel like, readers really can benefit, even though we're talking about some technical stuff here. What's super interesting to me is the way you do lay out alongside sort of the growth of the use of the shadow docket, um, that you t do talk about the Supreme Court history, things that I hadn't either known or thought about. I mean, I'm actually stunned because I am a huge nerd when it comes to William Howard Taft, maybe because I'm researching his role in the creation of the first lasting uh, federal income tax, mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, I went down and saw his papers um, at the Sterling Library at Yale, and I, you know, and he was whatever. I'm just a freak. I like this guy um, a lot. It's it's um, hard anyway. not to. <laughs> like he's sort of he's a lovable, like he's like a lovable big guy. Yeah, and the thing is, the thing about the bathtub, people say that he got stuck in a bathtub at the White House. And it's so totally then, apocryphal. Then he, but he may have gotten stuck in a bathtub at a hotel. Yes. Yes, but the White I mean, House story is totally apocryphal. Exactly. Okay, just so you know. <laughs> um, and, any, and you're a tall guy, though. So how tall are you, Steve? Um, I am. I am. I, part of my sympathy for Taft is I am. <laughs> I am also a very large person, although I am taller than he was. I'm six eight. Um, Jeez. So, but so, but so, I, I, sorry. I'm going to make it back to Taft. So, but yeah. like, but yeah, you could. I, so the thing is, can you? So you do. What's really great is that you do talk about how Taft, both as president. And then when he went on to be a law professor, and then when he's on the court, he tries to increase the court status. And I think it would shock people to know that the U.S. Supreme Court operated out of a musty basement, like in the Capitol building. And this sort of palace or church or shrine that they have now was, you know, sort of given to them by Congress. And I had this idea, which I did not, I don't know if it's ever come up, but like, you know, that you could be like, you guys, if you object to us expanding the court, you know, you could just kick them out of that building, make them go work in a basement. Well, so, so, anyway, but, but, no, but, but this is such an important, here. it's such an important yeah. point, though, because, like, I mean, before, this is something that I think a lot of folks are going to misunderstand about the book if they don't read it, um, right? Which is that my public commentary has been so focused on the current court, but the book is actually only really half about the current court. Um, and it's half about how we got here. Um, mm -hmm. Right. And that and that, you know, some of this was actually path dependency um, based on sort of decisions of prior generations. And, you know, I think I, I try to make the history as colorful as possible. It's why, like, I rely on colorful figures like Taft. Um, Frankfurter mm -hmm. does some work for us in the book um, because, you know, I'm also trying to sort of appeal even to the folks who think they know everything. Um, like there, there's going to be something for everyone to learn from this book, whether you are a Supreme Court nerd or a Supreme Court novice. But the broader point that the book tries to hit you over the head with is that really until at least the 1920s and at least to some degree until the 1980s, um, the court really was, if not beholden to the political branches, then at least dependent upon the political branches in ways that would, I think, seem totally if not shocking, then just jarring today. Um, you mentioned that you know Congress could kick him out of the building. I mean, Congress could, without even coming within a, a sort of a light year of the Constitution, um, mm -hmm. zero out the budget of every single person at the Supreme Court except the justices themselves, um, right? Congress could force the justices to go back out on the road 
and ride circuit <laughs> for circuits. six to nine months, right, out of every year. But, like, I mean, circuit riding is a great example. Like, oh, Steve, the, that's not a big deal. Harlan Crow will pay for the uh, private jet. Well, but there you go, right? So, but but the point there, though, right, until, so Congress made the justices ride circuit until 1891. Yep. Basically, Incredible. you got to go out on the road and hear cases in your home circuit. Um, by the, you know, Jen, by the late 18th century, there was, or by the late 19th century, there was no reason for that. Like, it, it accomplished no purpose other than reminding the justices who the boss was, um, right? And this and is the mentality. And that's a problem. Like, I think, you know, it's so funny because I may be skeptical about misuse of power and all this and maybe whether the court has always been somewhat political, blah, blah, blah. But I have to say, I want there to be an independent judiciary that is well, but, that is but a there's, good goal right so but the, so and so and the, we made the, that choice right so you mentioned the, this but, compared so to the, england the tightrope right the tightrope is independence versus unaccountable right and yes, and right and, and i think you know i am i mean i am on the record i am a firm defender of the institutional independence of the federal judiciary but you don't independence does not require unaccountability and I think that's where, you know, the, the sort of the, the, the theme that runs through the book is that as the court has claimed more power and as Congress has given it more power, I think we've, 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 that balance has gotten out of kilter. And I think we have sort of, you know, in the name of independence, gone too far toward unaccountability. And that in that respect, what's happened on the shadow docket in the last five or six years, right, which is really the focus of the back half of the book, is just a symptom of a much mm-hmm. broader disease, of a disease that I think is, you know, where the, the Clarence Thomas stuff I think is also a symptom, um, where this is just a court that is not remotely worried about being reined in by the political branches to a degree that has never been true in American history. And, you know, I think we had a, ve- I think we had a, a fairly independent court for large swaths of the court's history, even when Congress was being much more involved in the business of the court. So, you know, one of the one of the many layers I try to build in the book is the idea that one, this amount of power is not an originalist conception, right? That this is a modern development. Um, mm-hmm. That it's really a, a sort of Taft is the, is the spearhead of this. Um, and that two, um, maybe this is too much power, right? Not because I don't want the court to be independent, not because I'm pissed off at who the current majority is, but because just institutionally, a court that is not fearful of Congress is a court that is not a healthy institution. Um, and that the, you know, Madison in Federalist 51, right? Ambition ought to be made to counteract ambition. Um, there's mm-hmm. no counteracting of the court's ambition going on today. And how do we, so if you were going to, if you were going to tell, you know, in, in a stylized way, the sort of like the journey, you know, you talk about this being path dependent, but how would you, how would you in this, you know, you do this in the book, but how, can you glean from your own book that narrative of both the court's increasing independence and then sort of power grabs with the overuse or misuse of the shadow docket? But I also want you to tell the story of William O. Douglas, uh, you know, nailing decrees <laughs> to a tree because that's so vivid. So I don't know. You can pick. You can pick whatever. Pick any anecdote, but I, th- I thought that one. No, was no. Like, I mean, I mean the Douglas. I mean, <laughs> so the so the book opens with a case called Holzman versus Schlesinger, which you know, it's an, it's 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 an interesting litmus test for like do you, you know, have you heard of Holzman versus Schlesinger? Sort of how big of a Supreme Court nerd are you? Um, so this is a dis- so part of why the book I, I mentioned every single anecdote is deliberate, right? Um, Part of why the book opens with Holzman versus Schlesinger is because that was how emergency applications used to work. Um, so just to set the scene, right, this is, you know, uh, Congresswoman Elizabeth Holtzman and about a dozen Air Force officers are trying to stop what they believe is the unlawful bombing of Cambodia um, in the weeks leading up to a funding cutoff that Congress had passed. Um, 1973. In the summer of 1973, right? So U.S. troops were out of Vietnam. Nixon still bombing Cambodia. Congress says no more money after August 15th. Holtzman and her co plaintiffs want to say you can't even bomb until August 15th. Um, she's in Congress. I'm not sure you mentioned that. Yes. Yeah. Um, so they file suit in Brooklyn. They get an injunction, the only injunction in American history against an ongoing military operation. Um, and the injunction is to stop the bombing. But the injunction is stayed by the Second Circuit, by the Federal Appeals Court, basically frozen while they consider the appeal. And here's a context where, you know, this is all happening with two weeks to go before the funding cutoff. 
So everyone understands that like what happens in the emergency litigation is going to be dispositive, right? There's not going to be time for the full normal appellate process to run its course. With the so, clock ticking, yep. Right. So Holtzman first goes to Justice Marshall because he's the circuit justice for the Second Circuit. Um, and Thurgood Marshall, you know, gives the full process to Holtzman's emergency application, the application to, to lift the Second Circuit stay, to put Judge Judd's injunction back into effect. Marshall holds oral argument on the application. Marshall writes an opinion. And Jen, that was the norm, right? That, you know, when and you had- And he is, at yeah. that time, Marshall was in D.C. at that time? Yes, so Marshall's in D.C., okay. although most of the justices aren't, right? Mar Marshall's hanging out in D.C. for the summer, the, the rest of the court's not. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. um, and so Marshall does this all from his chambers in Washington, D.C. And the norm up to this point is that if you had an emergency application, you went and found your local circuit justice, you argued the matter to him, and he would often write an opinion, he would decide the matter, but, and this is what's critical, everyone understood because it was just a single circuit justice, the ruling would have no impact beyond that case, right? That like, And let there me was, stop you yeah. here. Um, right now there's, there's 13 circuits, um, but so people know, like, for example, uh, you know, I'm here in... Massachusetts. Um, and so um, my circuit is um, the first circuit. If I were in New York, it would be the second circuit. If I'm where Steve is, it's the fifth circuit. You can look at a map. You can just Google it. Um, okay, go ahead. No, right. And and uh, there are 13 circuits, but there are, you know, so there are nine justices. Um, you know, there are a couple who have multiple <laughs> circuit assignments, like the chief justice, I think, has two. Um, so the, but the norm was, right, that sort of to, to, to split the difference between having a way of acting quickly, but also not having that quick action produce too many effects, right? The mm -hmm. norm was to have everything done by the circuit justice. So Marshall does his thing. He denies the application because he says, my job is to rule as I think the full court would. And I think the full court would not vacate the stay. Um, at which point, Holtzman and her friends run to Douglas, right? Who is out at his, you know, shack um, in the woods outside Yakima, Washington. Um, and they convince Douglas to come down, literally to come down off the mountain um, and hold a hearing at the nearest federal courthouse, which is in Yakima. And by the way, though, this is what blew my mind. That was perfectly kosher. That was what you could do. Well, because, because you, you couldn't didn't like because, the answer because you couldn't you ask the full court, else. right? So, so one of the ways and one of the ways in which the shadow docket has evolved in ways I think are harmful um, is, you know, the court used to adjourn when it rose for its summer recess, meaning that the full court was not legally constituted to act over anything that came in over the summer. And if it were a big enough deal to require the full court to act, they'd literally have to come back to Washington and have what was called a special term. Um, so and in the meanwhile, first you went to your circuit judge. If you don't like the answer you got, you get to form shop, pick anyone, and they pick they pick Douglas. Well, and the idea was the idea was that in a context in which the full court was not assembled, um, better to give an applicant two bites at the apple, just in case maybe the circuit justice is unavailable, right, or the circuit justice is recused. Just, like it was a safety, it was a fallback. Um, well, but Douglas only two bites though, not not nine. Only only two <laughs> bites. Um, two two <laughs> okay. bites, not nine. Um, but I mean, even if you could try for a third, the way Marshall ends this, right, sort of yes, well, cuts it all off. So, spoiler, spoiler, spoiler alert. Uh, so um, Douglas ends up not, you know, ends up uh, vacating the state himself, right? Douglas says, "You've convinced me that this is, you know, a, good, a, a close enough case. I'm going to vacate the stay." And so he literally phones in the ruling to his clerks in their chambers in Washington. Um, and there's a great, I, I, this actually isn't in the book, but there's a great story about how like. All four of them are on the phone because they're each trying to take down a transcript. And the idea is that if they each try to take down a transcript, you know, they can reconstruct it and, and get close to what he actually said. Um, wow. So Douglas issues this ruling, basically, you know, putting the injunction back into effect, at which point the government goes back to Marshall and says, well, shit. Um, oh, pardon my language. Well, shoot. No, um, no, we, uh, we, uh, we use any language we want. This is, this is uh, not for children. Um, indeed. Uh, so so um, the government says, Maybe hey. sleeping by now. Seriously. <laughs> um, hey, Marshall, why don't you stay the injunction yourself? Um, uh -huh. And so they say, hey, you know, you got it. Douglas is going crazy. You got to stay the injunction yourself. So Marshall stays the injunction himself, writes another opinion. But this time, he puts at the end of the opinion, I have been in contact with the other seven members of the court, 
and they oh, wait, all so concurred. Stop here, hold on. It's six out. So there was a six-hour window. Yes, on Saturday, was, August fourth, nineteen seventy-three, where, where there was a there was a legal order in place that said Nixon, you can't keep bombing Cambodia. Yeah, although Gene but, Fidel has a great piece in the Green Bag where he has pretty conclusive evidence that the military ignored it, and that for six hours the military was actually in defiance of of the injunction. Um, mm. You know, these things are, are sort of sort Okay, of colored so we get Marshall. Right? Marshall's like, okay, before I was just going to ignore. It was easy to say I'm not touching anything that stays in place. And yep. now he's like, okay, what? You know, Douglas lifted it. I'm going to say no. I'm going to reverse you. And he was in touch with seven other justices. Right. So, so technically, Marshall didn't reverse Douglas. Technically, Marshall just granted a different kind of relief. So Douglas had vacated oh, okay. the Second Circuit stay. Marshall yes. issues a stay of his own. Um, Got you. And, and to, to sort of to, to basically signal to Douglas that he should desist, um, right? Marshall puts at the end of his opinion, "Hey, and I've been in touch with the other seven justices, and they all agree with me." Basically, like, you but know, not a conference call, one by one, a serial I mean, phone it's call. It's 1973, right? I mean, this, you know, and I mean, and, right. it, and, and indeed, I mean, this is before fax machines, so I don't know that right. anyone had even read Douglas's opinion. Um, anyway, this understandably sets Douglas off about the protocol, the procedure, the defiance of the norms for what happens when the court is acting as a body. And so Douglas writes this remarkable dissent from Marshall's second order, which, by the way, he can't legally dissent from because it was a single justice order, but that's a separate issue. Um, and he writes a dissent that basically says, here's why it's really important when the full court is acting for us to act in the way we've acted historically, which is we all get together in a room, we all talk about our ideas, we write opinions, we exchange drafts, we like we hammer this down, because if we don't do this, we are going to do bad things impulsively without enough, co- you know, to consideration, deliberation, etc. Um, and his dissent is basically a prediction um, of what happens. Uh, because after the Cambodia episode, although not in direct response to it, after the Cambodia episode, and really in direct response to the reinstitution of the death penalty, the court normalizes a bunch of the ad hoc things it had done in the Cambodia mm-hmm. case. Um, it starts referring all remotely divisive applications to the full court. So you can't get these justices dividing amongst themselves. Um, the full court, which, by the way, now can act over the summer because it no longer adjourns when it rises for the summer recess. So these are comes these are two positive developments then. I'm not sure they are actually. Oh, why? Why? So, Tell me why. Because the the norm before 1980 was the Marshall thing was you got oral argument and you got an opinion. And so you got oral argument, you got an opinion and it was from one justice which means no one thought it was the full court speaking in a way that was precedential. Oh, I get it. I get it. So you're saying if you're going to choose a lane, everyone should know this is you know, a flimsier thing. It's not right. Not don't. Let's not act like it's the full court. Let's just. Sh- but the irony was, is. you actually got more process and less impact, right? So, so the pre nineteen eighty model was more process for the parties. You got oral argument. You got you know an opinion, but less impact because it was one justice, not the full court. And both of those invert after nineteen eighty, where you get less process and more impact. Because now right, it's so the full court. So what happens in 1980? Because that it's, seems to be a big turning It's the point. death penalty. It is, It is. I mean, this was the, you know, I knew a lot of this stuff when I sat down to write the book. The, the chapter that I actually learned the most writing was the death penalty chapter, chapter three, because mm-hmm. it is just stunning how much the court, um, one, precipitates its own problem by the way in which it reinstitutes the death penalty in 1976, right? It does so with all of these hyper-legalized doctrines that now have to be litigated and through the quirks of procedure in capital cases are usually going to be litigated only once there's been a death warrant, meaning mm-hmm. only once, you know, someone's got to step in and freeze the execution by issuing a stay. So the court simultaneously creates a whole new universe of claims for death row inmates while, you know, the court's procedural doctrines push those claims into 11th hour emergency litigation. Um, that means that the, right, so just one data point. In 1960, the full court considers four applications related to executions in the whole term. In 1983, that number is 83, um, right? And so there's literally a flood. I mean, not literally, but there, there is a figurative flood of these applications um, that deluges the court starting in 79, 80, and 81. And the court's response is, we're going to do this as a, we're going we're to have the full court do this. We're not going to have argument. We're not going to write opinions. We're just going to resolve this one order at a time. And if you want to dissent, 
you know, Brennan and Marshall and Stevens and Blackman, you dissent. Um, and so these emergency it sounds yeah. like the the course you took in, in college. These these emergencies create this sort of opportunity, and then it expands from there. I want to ask you about this one other thing to clarify that people maybe aren't aware of. There was a time when the Supreme Court took the cases that were given to the court, you know, and it was required to hear cases, and it, it ran behind. Now. Uh, except for some exceptions, they make they choose what they pick and choose what they they want to hear. But with death penalty cases, are those do they? It seems like the, those appeals they have to make some choices, right? They don't get to choose those, or is that is that not true? So they, they in nine in the nineteen eighties, a lot of these were still mandatory, right? So the the court used to have a much broader mandatory docket, meaning appeals that the court at least theoretically had to hear. Um, one of Taft's big contributions is actually the rise of certiorari, the rise of, of the court's discretion to pick and choose cases. But at least in the early 80s, it was still the case that most appeals from state courts were mandatory, even if appeals from the lower federal courts were discretionary. And so part of what's happening in the 1980s is floodgates that are also a product right, of the, the court's residual mandatory docket. That goes away in 1988. I mean, so 1988 is when Congress makes just about all of the court's appellate jurisdiction discretionary. Um, the only ones that are left, the only today are um, certain uh, campaign finance disputes and certain redistricting disputes. Everything else is discretionary. And so with the death penalty, I mean, so what happens in the death penalty context is we see the rise of full court decisions in capital cases that are changing the status quo either by freezing executions or increasingly unfreezing them that are not explaining why, right, and that are not providing anywhere near the same amount of process um, to the to the lawyers, to the to the to the, to the litigants, um, and sometimes even in ways that are inconsistent across cases. Um, but and here's the saving grace, right? This practice, these pathologies, stay almost hermetically sealed in the unique space of the death penalty through mm -hmm. the 2000s, through the uh, early 2010s. You ask anyone who clerked on the Supreme Court between 1980 and, say, 2015, what they remember about the shadow docket, and they'll say death, right? It was, we, we never got emergency applications except in death cases, and it was all death cases. And so there was this sense that, like, you know, death is different. And so what the court is doing over there is just, you know, over there. So I just want to make sure we got, got these bullets, points. No, no pun intended, because it's... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, gosh. But... What made these these emergency um, appeals to the Supreme Court when someone's on death row and about to be executed, these we're going to refer to these as shadow and not merits because it didn't come with the bells and whistles you talked about. There's not going to be oral argument. There's not going to be brie you know the kinds of briefing and the long opinion. You're saying when when the, when the Supreme Court decides to either stay or not stay someone's execution. Or unstay. Or unstay, a stay, or vacate. When they decide, when the Supreme Court takes uh, what we would call in English literature courses, you know, engages in this performative utterance regarding someone being put to death. And whatever they say either may result in they're going to die now or will be held off. What does that text that they issue look like? It's, it's, not a, one of these it's, it's a sentence or two, right? You know, okay. the application for a stay to Justice Marshall and by him referred to the court is denied, period. And what remains in the shadows is whatever that deliberation looked like. We don't well, know and, what and, and, and what, what the claims were, right? I mean, what, you know, why it was denied, um, right? Was, is the court, you know, was there a procedural reason why the court didn't rule for this claim or did it not agree with it on the merits? I mean, like, you know, you have no idea, right, what exactly the reason was for the court's action. And that's hard for the public who might want to know why. That's difficult for future um, defendants and lawyers, right? I'm just trying to think of what we're, yeah. what we are robbed of by a skimpier record or process here. I mean, so I, I, I mean, I think that the yeah. public, the lawyers, the relevant government decision makers, but also, I mean, I think this is a, a more subtle but at no less important point, um, faith in the court, right? Because, yeah. you know, the principle, I mean, th this is not just me. This is the, the, you know, the court has said over and over again that a critical source of its legitimacy is the principled nature of its decision making. And one of, the, one of the most important ways in which the court conveys to the public 
the principled nature of its decision making is by telling us what the principles are. Um, right. And so, you know, when you have the court, um, you know, acting in a way that Jen might be principled, right? But but they're not telling us what those principles are. Um, you open up the court to charges, whether accurate or not, right? That the decision making is being motivated by things other than legal principle. Sure. Now, before we get to the like sort of the last bit of this, which is what changed in the 2010s, I want to pick it up on something that you said that I totally relate to, but but readers may not always know this. I love that you said that you learned the most in writing this book by working on this particular chapter three. And I think that people may have this idea that either scholars or writers just have this bounty of information in our head and we're just going to like pull it out piece by piece and put it down on paper. Um, as opposed to, I remember when I wrote my first book, my editor said to, you know, write the book you want to read. And the book you want to read is something that you, something's bothering you. You don't fully know. And so if you can remember, what are some of those discoveries where you kind of said to yourself, I can't believe I didn't know this or, you know, that kind of thing. I was literally sitting at like a kid's <laughs> indoor play gym, right? The <laughs> the weekend while I was working, what the, you know, while, while I was in the middle of writing chapter three, the death penalty chapter, because uh-huh. um, I knew I knew what anecdote I had wanted to start the chapter with. And I knew sort of what the general outline of the chapter was. But there was something nagging at me about like connecting like because chapter three is like the it's like the the ligament that connects the historical part of the book to the contemporary part of the book. And I just I hadn't nailed what the connection was other than chronological other than time. Um, And finally, like there were there were a couple of cases I was writing about um, that happened in like 1980, 1981. And it just like hit me like a bolt of lightning that Mm. there was a direct correlation between procedural changes the court had made that I already had dated to 1980, um, right? Unexplained procedural changes, the demise of in-chambers arguments, the move toward referring all divisive applications to the full court, um, right? Procedural moves that had never been explained. And I was like, why 1980? I was like, oh, because this is what they, like, this is what was happening that impelled, like, they were flooded with these kinds of cases and wanted to change, right? So it was like, I just had this eureka moment um, where the second I had that moment, the rest of the, uh, I, I, Karen, you know, if, if Karen were here, what she would say is, you know, I was really annoying the rest of the weekend because <laughs> all I wanted to do was write. Um, oh my gosh. Cause I, li- well, I literally wait, wanted you know- to like spill it. I, I want to like vomit it out of my head. Cause I had at, at that moment, the whole narrative of the chapter, if not that entire chunk of the book, right. Fell into place. So I, I love epiphanies that are described as, as vomiting things out. That's really nice. But what, what I realize, we have some young listeners. They may not know that the death penalty was, uncon- was unconstitutional for a while and that it wasn't. So can you help with that? Like, can you explain? Can you lay that alongside this? Yeah. So, I mean, the Supreme Court had largely stayed out of capital punishment entirely through the late 1960s. Um, and part of that is because, you know, as... Um, the, the sort of the rights that would make capital punishment unconstitutional mostly didn't apply to the states until the 50s and 60s. Um, and, you know, even the more liberal justices of the New Deal era had grown up in a time when capital punishment was not nearly as morally condemned as it became in many quarters in the 50s and 60s. Um, so it's really not until the late 60s, especially in response to some remarkable pioneering work by the NAACP's Legal Defense and Education Fund, um, led by Anthony Amsterdam, that there's really this concerted effort um, toward abolition, toward getting rid of the death penalty, um, politically and legally. And, you know, the legal side of that culminates in a 1972 decision called Furman versus Georgia, where a 5-4 court says the death penalty is unconstitutional. Critically, though, they can't agree as to why. Um, so there are a couple of justices, Brennan and Marshall, who think the death penalty is categorically unconstitutional. Um, Justice Potter Stewart, who ends up being the critical sort of swing vote, thinks that it's just not re- that it's constitutional in the abstract, but you could never implement it in a way that would be constitutional. Um, and so, you know, Potter Stewart famously sort of says, you know, I think we've ended the death penalty for all time. And he's totally wrong, because unlike Roe, where there's this remarkably inaccurate narrative that Roe provoked this immediate and serious 
public and political backlash. It didn't. Um, Furman did. Um, and so Furman produces this really aggressive, heated backlash against the court, especially in southern states, um, but even in Congress, where there are efforts to sort of respond to all of the things Stewart worried about, in his opinion, mm -hmm. in Furman. So that by 1976, four years later, um, the court is willing to bless at least some death penalty statutes. Not all. I mean, the, the court is very clear. Well, I shouldn't say very clear. The court is adamant <laughs> in the 1976 decisions that there are now requirements for capital punishment, that, you know, you have to prove aggravating factors. Um, not all murder can be capital murder in a state. You can't have automatic death penalties. Mm -hmm. There has to be an opportunity for defendants to put on mitigating evidence, um, right? There, like, lots of and things. And so because, because of this influx of these kinds of appeals in the 80s that are going to come through, the, whatever the, sort of the infrastructure they built for dealing with these emergency orders, they start using it for other things. And that's why this is this chapter is the ligament you're saying for the future. One. Right. And the real and the real inflection point is Trump. Um, right. That, okay, you know, so that's what I want to hear about. Yeah. So that right there, there are scattershot examples in the years before Trump, you know, the 5-4 ruling in 2016, where the court freezes Obama's clean power plan is one folks might have some vague recollection of. But, you know, it's really not until the flurry of applications from the Trump administration starting in 2017 um, that we see what had been, I think, you know, to my mind, problematic procedural shifts in how the court processed emergency applications that had to that point been limited to capital cases all of a sudden become mainstays of just ordinary litigation. What should the court do? In other words, what would what, when one of these emergency order comes on, right? Like you can pick any pick pick one of the many. What would you have done if you'd been on the court? Like what would the better choice have been to give yeah. more sunlight into the process? I, I actually think that the blue sky regime here is the pre nineteen eighty regime, um, right? Ha the the circuit justice model is not perfect, but it solves most of the biggest problems with what I think the court is doing today, right? Where if it's really an emergency, if you don't have, if, if you have time to kick it to the full court, just put it on the merits docket. And, exp and we've seen a couple of, you know, there were a couple of cases this term where the court did that. The student loan cases are a good example. Um, but if it's really an emergency and you got it, if it's like the Cambodia bombing case, you got to decide and the clock is ticking. So let me just back up. Let's go back to, like, like, for example, a student loan case, like the Supreme Court could put something on the merits docket and still put in place a stay. While it could. We wait. It could, right? or it could not, right? But I or mean, the could not. But the point is to sort of, you know, accept that you need to make a full-throated, full-bore decision as quickly as possible. But that doesn't require you to do it in three days, right? That you know, uh -huh. that in some cases, three months will suffice. Um, and and in the cases where you really only have three days, I think the circuit justice model is much better because it's the least worst alternative. It is, you know, someone with the power that you know to sort of adjust the status quo as necessary. Someone is who's in a position better to hear from all the interested parties, perhaps even hold oral argument, and write an opinion, but also someone whose decision is not going to be mistaken for a for ruling by the full right? court for a precedent okay. versus, right, what happened starting in the Trump cases. So in the Trump cases, what we see are a flood of applications from the federal government to put back into effect nationwide policies that lower courts had blocked. Um, it starts in the immigration space, so travel ban 2.0, um, yeah. sort of the interim travel ban is the first one. But it quickly spreads to the uh, ban on transgender uh, individuals in the military, um, to you know the census cases, to uh, other asylum policies, where all of a sudden the court is using unsigned, unexplained orders that had become sort of de rigueur in the capital context, in ways that are directly changing nationwide policy. Right. I mean, see, it seems to be one. You know, I was already complaining that an individual is being put to death now. You know, the society doesn't know what went on, future litigants and so on. But that's one person's crime. And I know crimes are, th are crimes against the state or crimes against the country. But in reality, it's very different than a policy around masking or around vaccines that affects hundreds of millions of people. The idea that they would use it in that context is 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 outrageous. I think. And, and, and well, I mean, or certainly it's outrageous when they're not explaining themselves, right? And yes. and and I think you know because it started with immigration policies, um, you know, there was a set like the death penalty. There was this sort of like, well, that's over there um, mentality on the part of many, right? But uh, you know, 
each successive use expanded where the court quickly normalized um, emergency applications as a way of making policy without making law. So just, you know, there are, there are any number of Trump policies that every single federal court to reach the merits of struck down that Trump was still able to carry out for years on end because of stays from the Supreme Court. Um, the border wall, right? No court ever upheld the border wall, and yet, you know, he got to keep doing it for three years. Why? Because of a stay from the Supreme Court. So, you know, that was sort of the first step um, of like the, the modern courts, I think, abuse of the shadow docket was taking what had been these death-specific departures from all kinds of transparency and accountability norms and applying it to lots of other contexts. Um, yeah, sorry. That's all right. I, so as we start to wrap things up, I just have to say this is like such a great book. It's not just going to make you know people feel smarter, um, but it will make actually make people smarter. And there's two things um, that they're really definitional. One, I, I, I want you to explain where the title came from. Because you, because there was, and then also, um, I, the, I think folks don't they, you, they hear about someone petitioning for a writ of certiorari, and not really knowing what that even means. Why? You, who's? It's sort of weird. So um, maybe you can explain what a, who's issuing the writ versus who's asking for the petition and the origin of that. And you can take either definition <laughs> in either order. Sure. I mean, was, I mean, I think this, this actually helps tie things together. So, right, the, the, the Trump cases sort of beget even more aggressive behavior after Trump leaves office, um, which finally pushes people to start looking at what the court is doing holistically. So with regard to sort of, you know, the, the nomenclature, um, so it's Will Bode, who's a Chicago law professor, who first uses the term uh, shadow docket in 2015 as a reference to this part of the court's work. And it's interesting that it's Will for a couple reasons. One, you know, he's a conservative former clerk to Chief Justice Roberts. He's not part of this secret cabal trying to, you know, de delegitimize the Supreme Court. Um, oh, come on. Wait, that, by the way, I, you're, you're grinning at me. So for listeners who can't see his face, there is no secret cabal trying to delegitimize the court. And no, Steve does not have, you know, a space laser in his office either. OK, continue. Uh, Jen is saying that because Justice Alito gave a speech at Notre Dame Law School in September 2021, <laughs> where he accused me by name and some other people of using the term shadow docket as a way to delegitimize the court. So you, you should read the book and decide for yourself if that's if that's what I'm doing. Um, but but Will's point, which I think which I've, I've shamelessly appropriated, albeit with his permission, um, is that, you know, what happens in the shadows is really important. Um, and, you know, the Will was actually talking about something we haven't even talked about today, which is, you know, a different side of the court shadow docket when it summarily reverses a lower court decision at the certiorari stage. Um, whole lot of words there. Basically, when the court <laughs> when the court issues a merits ruling without the full normal merits procedure. Um, but the, 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 the certiorari is a great place to end because um, certiorari actually is to me, I don't want to say the original sin, but it's sort of the, it is the, it is the piece at the bottom of the Jenga tower. Um, so the you know until 1891, the Supreme Court had absolutely no control over its docket. Um, if a, if Congress said you you should hear this case, then the court heard the case. Um, John Marshall even says in 1821, we have no discretion, you know, to not hear a case over which we have jurisdiction or to hear a case over which we don't have jurisdiction. He says would be treason to the Constitution. Um, well, starting in 1891. Congress tries this experiment where it gives the court a small, small modicum of discretion over which cases it hears as a way of trying to relieve docket pressure. Um, right mm -hmm. by 1891, the court had 1,800 active cases on its on its docket. It was at least three years behind, and so there's this like that is not in box zero, right? <laughs> um, so 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 it's like it's it's like this real modest experiment. Um, Taft, back to our, our hero, right? Taft <laughs> sees certiorari as the solution to all of the court's problems. Because if the justices have the power to pick and choose not just some of their cases, but all of their cases, then Taft thinks that the court will be able to rise above the fray of ordinary judicial business. And so act, explain what that yeah. word means, what, what certiorari means 
Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, no, I mean, so it's basically in Latin, it's basically like sort of, you know, um, sending up the record, right? Um, it's a writ that a appellate court directs to a lower court basically to send up all the proceedings um, that you shall be informed, I think, is the loose Latin translation. So in other words, if you're if I go, if I ask the U.S. Supreme Court for if I petition them for a writ of certiorari, what I'm saying is, will you please, Supreme Court, ask um, ask the First Circuit to send up the records to you. That's yes. what, right? Yes, but it's even worse than that, or it's even bigger <laughs> than that, because um, the way that the way that Taft conceives of and then executes on the certiorari power is not just, hey, First Circuit, or hey, Supreme Court, will you please ask this, the First Circuit to send my case to you? It's, hey, Supreme Court, will you please ask the First Circuit to send to you whatever questions in my case you want to answer? Um, oh, right. I forgot that. Like, they get to pick the questions, not what I want to put up on appeal. Right. But what they want, of the things of the things we're fighting about, what are the what, legal issues? What do you want to decide? Right. Yeah. And so, so it starts, right, with this sort of limited grant of cert, where I will ask the court to take up five questions and they'll choose two. But over time, mm -hmm. the court actually starts rewriting the question so that the court is basically deciding what questions it wants to decide within the cases it is choosing to hear. And Taft's insight is that this will transform the Supreme Court from a Supreme Court of Appeals that is just the last step up the ladder in a legal system into a true constitutional court that can sort of exist above and apart from ordinary judicial business, that can pick and choose the big questions it wants to decide, and that can sort of exercise autonomy and independence um, from the rest of the government, including the lower courts. And Jen, that's how we get to where we are today. Like that is right. the, the modern Supreme Court is entirely an outgrowth of the rise of certiorari and how the shadow docket through granting or denying certiorari empowers the court. Just one quick data point, right? Think about the two biggest cases from last term, Dobbs and Bruin, the abortion and the gun case. All right. Mm -hmm. In Dobbs, if you go back and look at the cert petition, no one asked the court to overrule Roe, right? It was not one of the questions presented. And the court's like, right. whatever, we'll do it anyway. And right. in Bruin, no one remembers this either. The court actually rewrote the question presented and then answered it. So, you know, even, even, even our myopic focus on the merits docket obscures the extent to which the merits docket is itself a creature yes. of the shadow docket. And that's the yeah, book. I mean, the book is like, this is how I we understand that, the court as an institution. I mean, what you've done for me is I'm always pointing to like Marbury versus Madison as this kind of kind of bold power grab with, you know, the right of judicial review, meaning deciding whether an act of Congress is constitutional. But I'm now seeing what Taft did and what the court's done over the years to be so much bigger than that. And we get to the very as we close now, it's sort of like people have to read the book to hear all of your recommendations. But um you know, this is Congress did this, even though we're saying Taft, you know, he had to, it was Congress. Congress show, can give and take away. Yeah, he, he lied point. a little. He lied to Congress a little. <laughs> I mean, let's let you know, let's not let him off the hook. I mean, right. So okay. but no. But yes, I mean, so so you, Taft sort of snookers Congress a bit in 1925. By 1988, when Congress, you know, finishes the project, Congress knows full well what it's doing. I mean, yes, this is a story not just about the Supreme Court taking power. Right. It's a story about Congress giving it away. And. And, and as a result, right, part of the imperative, I think, is for Congress to reclaim, Jen, any, I mean, you know, people Some say- what accountability, right? You want, yes. you say you want independence, but you want the rebalance so there's more accountability. What right. does that look like for you? Trust, but verify, um, right? You know- I love when people quote Reagan. It's not <laughs> Reagan. It's a Russian proverb. Reagan stole it from the Russians. Oh my gosh. Yes. Reagan, it, How do you say it in the original Russian? I, I'm gonna botch it. I'm, I'm gonna botch it, but it actually rhymes in <laughs> Russian. If you say it correctly in Russian, it rhymes. Oh yeah. Yes, uh, that's part of why. Uh, hence the hence the save. Anyway. Um, Oi, who knew? Okay. Exactly. So the way. So so how does it start? Um, the short version is it actually. This is gonna sound weird, but I, I I hope it makes sense. I think there are lots of specific reforms Congress can and should pursue, but the most important thing is for Congress to do anything. Um, right to sort of um, start back up the mountain where Congress is regularly involved in an inner branch dialogue, not about the size of the court, not about term limits, not about like, you know, impeaching Justice Thomas, but about Congress as an institution exercising meaningful oversight 
over the Supreme Court as an institution. And mm -hmm. there are so many different shapes and flavors that can take that ought not to be controversial, that ought not to be partisan. Um, mm -hmm. That like the, you know, we shouldn't be scared away from the low hanging fruit by the fact that there will be, you know, bigger fruit farther up the tree. Um, and that's where and I think, you think the book both ends. parties. I mean, do you think that it's possible um, for both parties to kind of do this without making it, you know, trying to score partisan or electoral points? So I think everyone's going to assume the answer is no. And, and my job is to persuade people that the answer is yes, um, yeah. right? That there are some, that, you know, the, the, the court's docket, just really quickly, really quick data point, right? This term is the fourth term in a row where the court's going to have fewer than 60 merits decisions. Um, it hadn't dropped below 60 since 1864, right? Incredible. So, you know, this is something that, you know, if I'm a Republican, maybe I want the court deciding more cases. I mean, right, the, this is something that doesn't, you know, the, the number of cases the court decides is not obviously ideological or partisan, um, right? The notion that Congress should actually have some say over what cases the court decides is not ideological or partisan, right? None of this is about taking power away from the current majority. What it's about is it's about creating more lines of accountability between mm -hmm. that majority and whoever happens to be in charge at the moment in Congress. And we've ha we have lots of historical practice where Congress mm -hmm. is controlled by one party and asserts itself against its own party in the court and asserts itself against the other party in the court. Like that, mm -hmm. that hadn't stopped us until the last 25 years. And that's, that's what I want us to get back into the habit of talking about. It's why it's so important that when we talk about the Supreme Court, we talk about the entire institution and not just you know, affirmative action, independent state legislature, the, the big merits rulings that everyone is so rightly, right, interested in, but not mm -hmm. to the exclusion of the rest of the story. So as we close, is, is there anything I didn't ask you that you wanted to talk about? And also, how do people find you? Yeah, I mean, the, the last thing I'll say, and then and now I, I can do the quick uh, where to find. I'm, I'm pretty easy to find. Um, <laughs> as, as Judge Kaczmarek says, I'm a professor with a Twitter account. Um, so, oh, man. Just, but the last part of the story is, you know, folks who know me and or know my stuff, you know, might be a little skeptical that I come in sort of, that I come to save the institution as opposed to burying it. Um, but, you know, this is part of why the conclusion of the book spends a lot of time talking about John Roberts. Um, because, right, Roberts has actually had this remarkable string of, you know, pushing back against the other five conservatives with regard to how they're behaving on the shadow docket. Um, in ways that we don't see if we look at the merits docket. And I actually mm -hmm. think, like, it, the fact that John Roberts is expressing some of these same concerns is pretty powerful and persuasive evidence to me that this is not just about, you know, progressives trying to criticize the conservative majority. This is actually institutional um, in ways that are pretty significant. Um, as for me, um, so, you know, if, if you haven't been totally horrified by this whole conversation, Mm -hmm. um, I'm on Twitter at Steve underscore Vladek. I have a uh, weekly Supreme Court substack called One First, um, a, a not so subtle uh, a nod to the Supreme Court's physical address. Um, right. Um, I'm I don't know. I'm everywhere else on the on the Internet. Um, and my book, uh, The Shadow Docket, you can find out more information at tinyurl.com slash shadow docket. And how do we find your fabulous wife, Karen, who is also a lawyer but just went into legal recruiting? Yes, more importantly, uh, Karen is on Twitter <laughs> at KSVESQ, um, and she is a much better follow than I am. What is her firm that she she recruits for? Uh, Whistler so, or yep, something? Whistler Partners. So Karen, um, about a year and like two months ago, um, Karen did this really fabulously cool um, and, and courageous um, you know, mid-career sort of mini job switch where she went from being a practicing law firm partner to doing legal recruiting. Um, and she hasn't, I mean, she's loved every second of it. it. It's, you know, as she says, she gets to do all the fun stuff she liked about lawyering and none of the stuff she didn't like. So it works out well That's for great. her. It's important. I think law is a, a career over a lifetime. I mean, some people are lawyers, law professors, and then soon they become historians like you. <laughs> well, we'll see. I, I, you know, I haven't, I, I haven't given up on the present just yet. Okay, you can do all of the above. Thanks so much, Steve. Thanks, Jen. That was an incredible conversation. All of Steve Vladek's students are very lucky to have him as a professor. Think about what you could learn in an entire semester after just that brief conversation that we had. 
And I will be back next week with another show as we continue to explore the writing process and the nonfiction world together. Please let us know what you think. Send me an email at bookedup at politicon.com. You can also write to us on paper at P.O. Box 147, Northampton, Massachusetts, 01061. To keep up with the show and our featured authors, follow Booked Up on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. And please give Booked Up a five-star review. It really will help other people find the podcast.